fabulous listeners. This week and next, I am running a special free seven-day trial for two of my three Patreon levels, Page Turners and Lit Lovers, because I want everyone to have access to my Patreon experience to see if it is for them. It is such a wonderful group of readers. In connection with this promotion, today I am running one of my recent Patreon episodes with Kelly Hooker. In addition to coming on my main show regularly, Kelly also chats with me every other month for my Patreon community about a themed book topic. Before she and I dive into a chosen topic, we discuss recent reads, books we have DNF'd, and fun bookish news. If you want more information on joining my Patreon community, go to patreon.com slash thoughts from a page or click on the link in my show notes. Enjoy. Welcome, patrons. Today, Kelly and I are chatting all about auto buy authors. When we first came up with this topic, I thought it would be an entertaining one, but it'd be one that would take me no time at all to pull together my favorite authors and talk about them. But actually, in the end, and Kelly says the same in this interview, it really took a lot longer than I thought it would. I debated and debated who to include, and then I had to think about whether somebody whose current book I didn't love but loved their earlier book should be an autobi author. And it also just made me really think about a lot of different things. I mentioned growing up reading series and that I don't read series a ton now, but whether those should be autobi authors. So it ended up being a much more involved topic than I thought it was going to be, which was a ton of fun. So I hope you enjoy it. I look forward to hearing your autobi authors. And if you have any questions for us about any of it, just feel free to drop them in the comments to this episode. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Kelly. How are you? I'm doing great, Cindy. How are you? Great. These are some of my favorite episodes, our special Patreon ones. So I'm thrilled to pieces to be chatting with you. Me too. I had so much fun prepping for this one too. I had so much fun prepping for this one too. And we can talk about that in a little bit because really I ended up doing a much deeper dive into some of this than I thought I would. Yes, me too. So what's been going on with you? Well, we are preparing to go on vacation as a family to Mackinac Island um, next week. So I'm really looking forward to that. We are not bringing our youngest... (laughs) Um, little boy. He just turned one and he's just not a vacation guy yet. So um, we're looking forward to some time with our big boys. That will be so nice because the big boys will really appreciate it. The age that Ben is at, it's just difficult to travel with them, especially when they're the third. Right. And he doesn't make things easy (laughs) ever. So we're just going to enjoy some time um, without him and um, he'll be with my parents and having the time of his life and well loved. So we're happy for him too. (laughs) Exactly. And he'll be happy not to be in the car. Yes. Yes. What's new with you? Well, we're headed out of town too. We're headed to Colorado for a couple of weeks. We leave on Friday. And I'm so excited because it's a place we have gone most summers, but we haven't gone for the last two summers. So we go to Estes Park, the YMCA of the Rockies facility. So my kids are super excited. My oldest can't come because she has to work, but my other two are super excited. They're bringing friends at different times. I'm bringing a pile of literally like 20 books. My husband keeps shaking his head. He's like, I don't know what you think you're going to do with all those books. But I'm like, it's so pretty there. I can take photos and I'm such a mood reader. So I can just pick up what I want when I want. I won't have to worry about reading for the show. I mean, obviously, I will still be reading for the show ahead, but I can also just pick up whatever I want. I've got a couple backlist books I'm excited about. So I'm looking forward to that. That sounds awesome. Are there any independent bookstores in that area? I know you're going to be kind of remote, but any stores that you're looking forward to checking out? 
Well, there's one in Estes Park called McDonald's, and we always go there. And it's funny, it's called McDonald's. And especially after our conversation with Nick Yesterday. last night, yeah. I know I was laughing. And it's really cute and sweet and little. And we always run in there and, and buy books from them while we're there. And then I like Tattered Cover, which is in Denver. So as we're coming and going from the airport, dropping people off, picking them up, I'll often run in there. And that's actually a great idea, though. I need to check out if there are any others. I know Boulder has one, and I think I've been in there before. So I need to try to make a list of a few because we are going to be coming and going from the airport, picking kids up, dropping kids off, and I ought to be able to stop at a couple. Yeah, I think that's great. I'm really looking forward to checking um, one out again in Mackinac Island. It's called Island Books. And when I went there last summer, they had some great local recommendations, which was really fun. And um, I ended up really loving one of the books that they had recommended to me. And Mackinac Island also has a really cute library. Like it's bright teal and it's right on the Straits of Mackinac. And so you can sit out in these Adirondack chairs right behind the library and read. And it's just, it's the best spot. I remember you posting about that last time you were there, right? Yeah. Yep. It's one of my favorite reading spots. And um, I just can't wait. There's just something fun about vacation reading. I love vacation reading as well. The other funny thing that happened to me this morning, it's Tuesday, July 25th that we're recording. This will not run until sometime in August. But I woke up this morning thinking that Pip Williams' book, The Bookbinder, was coming out on August 1st because that's what's written on my book. And that's what all my emails from the publicist said. And so I was all geared up for that. I had just done my August releases episode yesterday. (laughs) And then I have all these emails from the marketer and the publicist. Today is the pub date for the book binder. And I was like, what? So the publicist wants to know when the interview is running. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. So I, I don't know what's going on, but they clearly moved the pub date up. I somehow missed it. I thought maybe it was a celebrity pick, but I don't think it is, or at least not a big one, because Heather Green, who's a patron, always is got her finger on the pulse with that. And she's provided what she thinks, you know, the rumors are for those three. So I'm so curious why it moved up. Huh. I wonder if it might be a book of the month club. Maybe. But I had to like literally shuffle all of my interviews and make sure I posted about the book. And then I was just laughing because it was an August Reads pick, but it's all good. But it's just kind of funny. I was like, oh, that rarely happens to me. But somehow that one got by me. Yeah, just some bookish stress. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. When I'm trying to get out of town, I'm like, wait a minute. (laughs) So let's do our last now next. What have you read recently? Okay, the last book that I read, I just finished it last night, and it's called The Last Love Note by Emma Gray. And it doesn't come out until November, but just get this on your radar because I think you're really going to want to read this. This is a story about a young mother who loses her husband and the ways that she strives to move forward years after that really staggering loss to find happiness. And the author has a deep connection to the story because she also lost her husband as a young mom. And you can tell that she is writing from what she knows. If you just want to feel the full range of emotions, this story is going to do it for you. Like I laughed, I cried, and I I often don't cry during books, but it was just so good. So that was The Last Love Note by Emma Gray. That's a Zibby's book, right? That's the one you were telling me about the other day. Okay, I don't have that one on my list. I need to get it. Yes, it's an Australian author and the book was already released in Australia and this will be the US debut through Zibby and it's their November release. Okay, good. Well, I will definitely add that one to my list and we're going to talk about it later, but I talk about how much I love books set in Australia, so. Ooh, perfect. So my last book was Dark Ride by Lou Burney, which I've posted a little bit about in the Facebook group. I was super excited for this one. It was actually one of my most anticipated for the year, and it just didn't really work for me. I've decided after reading this book by Lou Burney that I loved his book, The Long and Far Away Gone, which I read last year. It's an intense book, decently heavy, involves a shooting at a movie theater, but it is so well done. And it's one of those books that I still think about all the time. Like it'll just, some portion of the book will pop into my head or something he said in the book will remind me of something. It's just one of those that has really stayed with me. But I tried November Road, which won an Edgar. So I mean, obviously, it's a popular book. And I couldn't really get into that. And then I tried Dark Ride, which actually didn't sound very good to me. But I thought, well, I'm gonna try it anyway, because I loved The Long and Far Away Gone. And I didn't love it either. It's this 21 year old stoner who just does pot all the time. And for some reason, those stories just kind of drive me crazy. I'm like, quit smoking pot and get up and do something. (laughs) But so he's the main character. 
And he sees these two abused kids when he goes to put off a parking ticket. And he gets obsessed with them and thinking they're abused and tries to kind of wiggle into their life and save them. I, this is no spoiler. That is what the story, you know, like that's the summary of the story. Mm -hmm. I liked the beginning, fine. And I liked the end, fine. But the middle just was so unrealistic and all this stuff kept happening. And I was tired of all the pot talk. And it just was not my book. So I've decided, and, and today we're talking about auto by authors. And we gave some parameters and we'll talk about those later. But I think if I had not read Dark Ride, and obviously it's not going to fit our parameters anyway, but I might have thought, oh, Lou Burney is an auto by author for me, but I have decided he is not. The Long and Far Away Gone was a one-off for me, and the rest of his books probably just aren't written for me as an audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a bummer when that happens. But, you know, at least I know it, and he's got plenty of readers, and every book is not for every person. But it's just interesting because you think, oh, I, I loved one book. But I don't know that really generally I'm going to love his books, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, what are you reading now? I just started Museum of Failures by Thridi Umrigar, and she is the author of Honor, which was one of my favorite books of last year. I'm a few chapters in, and I'm loving it so far. It is about a man from India who lives in the United States and their family's journey to adopt a child from India. And I'm so curious. I haven't really read the synopsis much. Um, I just want to go in blind and see where the story takes me. But I really love her writing. And this one is out September 26th. And that's the Museum of Failures by Thridi Umrigar. I always hear great things about her books. Yes, definitely. What are you reading? I'm reading The First Ladies by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. It got by me earlier in the year because so many books were coming out, but I loved The Personal Librarian, so I'm really excited to get into this one. I've just started it. Oh, good. I can't wait to hear what you think. That one got by me, too. I know. I just feel like the first six months of the year, books were literally coming out right and left, and it was just hard to keep up. And so now I'm like, okay, things have settled down a little bit, and I can pick up a few of those that I missed the first time around. Yep, definitely. What's up next for you? Let Us Descend by Jessamine Ward. This comes out October 3rd. This book is described as a haunting masterpiece, sure to be an instant classic, and it's about an enslaved girl in the years before the Civil War. Liz's reading on Instagram described this as the perfect book. So that's setting the bar pretty high, um, and her tastes are quite literary, so I'm expecting that type of book. But when somebody praises a book in that way... I just have to pick it up. So I'm excited for Let Us Descend by Jasmine Ward. I'm so glad that you're reading this next because I keep hearing absolutely fantastic things about it and I have it. But every time I go to look at it, I'm like, oh, I think this is really dark. So I'm glad that you're going to read it. You can tell me what you think and then I can try it if I think I can do it. Yes. I don't know if it'll be a vacation read for me. So I'm hoping I can finish before I go. It doesn't seem like that type of book, but I'll report back. Well, there's no rush. It's not one that I'm going to be getting to in the next couple of weeks anyway. Yeah. Well, what's next for you? What's next for me is The World's Largest Man by Harrison Scott Key. It's a backlist title. I interviewed Elizabeth Passarella recently, and she recommended all three of his memoirs. And two of them sounded really good to me. And this is the first one. And so I ordered the first two. And this one has already come in. And I'm taking it with me. And I doubt I'll get much reading done before we leave. But I'm going to try. But... It's definitely going on the trip with me, and I can't wait to start it. Oh, I love Elizabeth, and I'm so happy to hear that you're picking up a book recommended by her. Me too. So now we're going to dive into the part that seems to really resonate with listeners, which is what we DNF'd. And I think people enjoy hearing what didn't work and why. And so we have added DNFs as a permanent part of our every other month chats. So what has not worked for you since we last talked? Well, let me first say that I'm so thankful for this section because it gives me permission, I think, to stop reading books because I'm like, okay, well, I'll have this for that the podcast then. And otherwise, I think I would be plowing through books that weren't working for me. So this is helpful to me as well. But the first book that I DNF'd was The Hike by Lucy Clark, and this comes out in August. I was reading this with a group of readers called Arc of the Month Club, and they select books months in advance to read. And so I was in a chat group and I was a little bit behind the pace of some of the other readers in the group. And they were leaving some comments, spoiler free, but really the general consensus was that people were really disappointed in this book. And I was only about maybe 15 to 20% in. 
And I just wasn't feeling invested in the characters. I did not care what was happening. And then just to hear other people who had just finished and said, this was really disappointing for me, helped me decide to stop reading. So I I always now wish I could have this chorus of readers reading the same thing that I am at the same time saying, it's okay to DNF. Like it just gave me that little extra boost that I needed. Well, you know how I feel about this one because I read it a while ago and I didn't DNF it. I got to the end, but I didn't think it was very good at all. And I actually loved her book last year, One of the Girls, Mm -hmm. and I've recommended it to so many people. So I was super excited for this one. It was another one of those times where I was like, oh, good. The next book, it's going to be good. And then I was like, what? And it was just slow and I didn't like how it resolved. And I just felt it was disappointing. And you and I've talked a a little bit about this before the show started. And I saw it on a couple of lists, not many, but a couple. And I was kind of surprised. And I thought, well, maybe I'm an outlier because sometimes I am a tough critic for thrillers. I mean, I know that there are a lot that I don't like that people still end up liking. So I was kind of happy to hear that not only did you, but an entire group didn't really like this book. I just didn't think it was a very good one. It's got a great cover, but I didn't think the story was very good. I know I was bummed too because I brought it with me on vacation in June and I have this beautiful picture that will sadly never make it to my Instagram feed. Well, and what you said about DNFs is interesting because what happens to me is I do leave books right and left like 10% in, 15% in, especially stuff I'm reading digitally. It just doesn't always seem to grab me as well. But I don't consider that I'm DNFing it a lot. I just never get back to it, but I don't really always record it as a DNF. You know, I just am like, oh, I tried that one and it didn't work. So this is helpful because it does at least help me move a couple into the I'm never returning to this book, most likely category of DNFs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what ones have you pulled the plug on recently? Well, the first one is The Other Half by Charlotte Vassell or Vassell. I don't know how you say her last name. It comes out sometime this fall. And it's a mystery that it had some conversation around it. But I started it and I just don't like the way she writes at all. It was very jerky and hard to follow. And I was just having a lot of trouble getting into the jargon and the way the story was told. And so I just decided it wasn't for me. And I sent it back with, I will not finish this one. Good for you. Yeah, exactly. I pat myself on the back. I'm happy. (laughs) What's next for you? The Kind Worth Saving by Peter Swanson. This was my second DNF as of late. And this is like a loose sequel to his previous book, The Kind Worth Killing, which I loved that book. I thought it was so clever. The Kind Worth Saving is not. (laughs) I was buddy reading this with two other friends. And again, I was like a little bit behind their reading schedule. They were just like a few chapters ahead and they were not thrilled. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to take a back seat here. And one fearless reader just plowed through and finished And she said 2.5 stars was generous. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to finish it. And I trust my friend here. And she just said nothing was happening. And she did not care. And really the feedback, the general consensus, I think, for that book is a lot of people haven't enjoyed it. So I I guess I'm glad I gave it a try because I think I would have wondered because I did enjoy The Kind Worth Killing so much. But this was not it for me. I've only read two of his books. Nine Lives, which I liked, but I don't think it has great reviews. It's a, a, and then there were none takeoff. And then another one, I cannot think of the name of it, but I didn't like it at all. I thought it was so predictable. It's about the, it's a bookstore owner and there are eight books and somebody's following the, the deaths, the killings in each of the, the eight books. And I don't know, I, I, I didn't like the ending and I could see it coming from like page five. And so, you know, probably not that early, but I mean, very early on. So yeah. I sort of have mixed thoughts on him, but those are the only two I've read. I liked one and I didn't like the other. Yep. Sometimes that happens. It does. So my next one is Do Tell by Lindsay Lynch. And she is a bookseller at Parnassus in Nashville in the store that Ann Patchett owns. And this is her debut and it's set in golden era Hollywood. So you would think it would be the perfect book for me because I love, love, love that time period. But much like you're describing nothing happening in a book, that's what I felt like in this book, like nothing was happening. I just kept reading and I was like, I don't really care about these people. They don't really seem to be doing very much. So after about 30% in, I just gave up and it came out in early July. Okay. Yeah. I haven't heard much about that one. Yeah. I think there was some chatter because of her role at Parnassus and working with Ann Patchett that kind of pushed it up a little bit in terms of 
booksellers talking about it and the publishers talking about it, but I don't think it's really resonating much with readers. At least I've not seen that it is. No, I haven't either. Do you have any others? Nope, that's it. I have one more and it's The Housekeepers by Alex Hay. Did you read that? No. So it's another one that had a lot of pre-pub chatter. And I'm not really sure why. I was thinking a lot about that while I was getting ready for this because people were raving about it ahead of time. You know, the publicist, which of course they're going to all be raving about other books. A few booksellers, I think maybe Pamela talked about it on one of the episodes, but I just thought it was really slow. They're saying it's like Downton Abbey meets something or another. It's got to do with a theft, upstairs, downstairs kind of thing. So the servants that work in a certain house are planning a big theft. But again, it was one of those that the pacing was so slow. And I think the reviews are not good on Goodreads. Like, I don't think it's working for readers at all. Mm -hmm. Yep, I can see that. Yeah, but it's another one that I was just like, okay, going to put it aside. But, you know, it is freeing. It's nice. I left it in my little free library. I was like, I'm done with this one. Moving on. Because there is a lot of good stuff coming out. Yes, definitely. And I think that's what's keeping me motivated to continue to set aside books that aren't working for me is just focusing on that next book that I'm getting to start early because of my decision to walk away from some. Absolutely. It gives you more time. Mm -hmm. So now we come to one of my favorite segments, which is our news related to books. And I am thrilled to pieces because I am hosting Alice Feeney from the UK in early September and you are coming. And I just cannot wait to meet you in person. I know. I am just so, I just get a big smile on my face whenever I think about my trip. So I'm thrilled to come to see you. And this is crazy to me, but meeting Alice Feeney at your literary salon, I think will be my first in-person author event. I do not think I have been to an author event before. I don't think I knew that. No, I, no. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, that is it. Well, that's so exciting. And then the super fun part is The Early Reads Conversation with Carrie Mayer is the night before. So we're going to be on Zoom together to do that. And then we have the Alice Feeney event the next morning. So it's going to be a very big bookish event. Yes. And I've gotten a few messages from people in the Houston area that are like, oh, I'm going to that. I'll see you there. And I just can't wait to meet everybody in person and just give you the biggest hug. It's going to be so fun. I know. I'm so excited. And Karen Naughton, who lives here in Houston but spends the summers in Maine, even messaged me and said, I wish I was going to already be back because I would love to meet Kelly. But she's like, it's too hot. And I was like, yeah, it's still hot here in (laughs) September. So she is not going to be back, but I know she wishes she were. Aw, stay in Maine, Karen. (laughs) Exactly. Definitely stay in Maine. The other fun thing that happened was we just had the early reads conversation last night with Nick Fuller Guggins. I would have the hardest time getting his name out correctly. On the Great Transition was the book. And the book was so well received, but I think he was so well received as well. That was one of my favorite author chats we've had. Yeah, mine too. He was just so gracious. And I love that his background prior to writing his book was as a teacher and just his thoughts about writing a book and having that in the back of his mind that he's an educator and educating kids for the future and then what the future may or may not look like that he's speculating about. I just thought that was awesome. I thought he was great. And it's another person that I thought a lot about while we were doing this topic because we decided with Autobuy, which we'll talk in a little bit about, that it was people that we had read at least two books. And since he's a debut author, he can't be on the list, but he definitely would be an autobi author for me. Like I love this book so much that I will read anything he writes going forward. But I agree that like two books is where we should be because that kind of gives you a sense as I was talking about with Lou Burney and maybe Peter Swanson. You know, you don't know if it's a one-off or if you're going to love a lot of their books. So, but it made me think, oh, that's interesting. Hopefully his next book is equally good and then he can be an autobi author for me. Yes. And he was able to show us multiple cover options that the publisher had presented him with prior to settling on the current cover. And I thought that was so fun, too. And I know that covers are your thing. And that was just a really fun added bonus. It really was a fun added bonus. And he was just so nice. And it was so interesting. I feel like the conversations are getting better and better because the group is feeling more comfortable and people are happy to leap in and ask whatever they want. And I think it just makes a more dynamic conversation because everybody's coming from a different perspective. Right. I think that's true. Yeah. Well, now we can dive into auto by authors and we each selected 10 and we came up with a couple of parameters, which I probably have already spoiled. But one is that we have to have read at least two of their books. And were there any others? 
I don't think so. I think that was just... <laughs> well, then we have one parameter, which okay. is we have to have read two of their books, so, so um, which knocks out debut authors. But I think that's valid. And we're going to talk about debut authors another time. So I'm excited to hear what yours are, because a lot of times we'll share our list, but we didn't today. No, we didn't. And I'm wondering if there will be a, some overlap, but I'm curious to know what makes this author auto buy for you and me, because that might be different. I agree. And the other thing I'll mention is that I grew up reading series. Like when I was young, I read Trixie Belden and Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys and all of those different type of books that often were in series. And so that is what I have, that is what historically I read a lot of. When I got out of law school, I still read tons of mystery series. That was kind of what I gravitated toward. But I didn't really want to list a bunch of series authors in my auto buy because to me, that's a little different than an auto buy author because if you're reading a series, you're probably most likely going to grab the next book no matter what. So I'm going to list out six or seven auto buy series authors for me at the end, not spend much time talking about them at all, but just list them out. But all of these, but one are standalone authors for the most part. I'm so excited to see your list of series authors because for me, I am not a big series reader just because really in the last five years since I had my first son is when I got super invested into reading. I would just read like, a chapter of a book before I went to bed and like fell asleep with it and then have to read the same chapter, you know, the next night. And that's okay. You are still a reader if this is you too. But my reading has changed so much. I just read so much more now um, because I'm not in grad school and I, I played basketball in college and things like that. I'm home more and I, I just prioritize reading more. So I don't have the longevity of reading like you have where you've been able to build these series with authors over the course of years. And it's intimidating for me to see that an author has like 20 books out in this series and like want to jump in from the beginning. So I do have a few authors in my next list coming up, my auto by authors that have started series that I plan to continue with. Yeah, I, I'm just curious to see what you have to say with your series. Well, and it's so interesting because there are some series that I read for years, like Lee Child's Jack Reacher, but I don't need more, like Michael Connolly's Harry Bosch, but I don't need more. Sometimes these book series get to like 20 something books and I'm like, that's just a lot with the same character. And so I have kind of retired those, but there are some that like Jacqueline Winsbeer, who I'll list later, who I've read from the beginning and continue to love. So I always pick up her books. So it is interesting to see which ones have remained on my list and a lot of them are newer. And that's why I've never read Louise Penny because I didn't start from the beginning with her and I think she's on 20 something now and there's no way I'm going back and reading book one all the way up. And I often do actually leap into the middle of series, but it's hard to leap into the middle of a series with 20 books. I mean, like I think it's like yeah. if you're in book four or five, it's not that big a deal. But if you're going to miss literally the first 20 books, it could be a problem. That's funny that you say that about Louise Penny. I was just wondering if you were a penny pusher, because that's, that's what the, the group is called of her readers. But I have actually read, I think maybe the first three of those books, and I did the audio and the audio was great. But the my beloved narrator passed away. And I just the narrator that picked up wasn't the same. And so I just never returned to Three Pines. Well, that's interesting that you say that about the audio, because one of my best friends from college, drives back and forth from West Virginia, where she lives, to Wisconsin, where her mother is. And so she's driving back and forth a lot. So she's listened to, I think, like 16 of them so far. And that's what she just does on those drives. She's just slowly working her way through the Louise Penny series. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. But I don't really have driving that I do like that. Yeah, that's a nice idea. But there's just so many new books coming out. And that's really where my heart is. Yeah, I agree. So and, and for some reason, those just don't sound all that appealing to me. And so, you know, I, I think there are so many books out there and I usually have a pretty good sense for what's going to work and what's not for me. Yep. Okay. So I can't wait to hear your first auto buy author. I'm going to start off with Amor Tolls. He was my first auto read author that came to mind after I read Rules of Civility. I just knew that I would let him take me anywhere. I just love the way that he puts words together and what he says about human nature just really resonates with me. And I think the thing that I really like the most about him is that he always challenges himself to go in a new direction. So with Rules of Civility, he writes about a year in the life of a young woman about to climb the social ladder in the 1920s. And then he shifts to A Gentleman in Moscow, which covers the life of a Russian aristocrat over three decades. 
and then to the 1950s with the Lincoln Highway. And that's set over only 10 days. And so his three books are just very different, but I've loved them all. And A Gentleman in Moscow was actually one of the first character-driven novels that I have loved. I remember reading it and just waiting for the pace to pick up. I was always such a plot-driven reader. I wanted that. So this whole time I'm reading about the Count in Russia, and I'm just like, what's, what's happening here? Why isn't this moving faster? And then after I finished the book, I was like missing him. And I, then it dawned on me like, oh, this is what character-driven stories are all about. So I just love Amor. That is one of my all-time favorite books, and I cannot wait for the movie to come out. I am just so excited. I hope it's going to hold up and be even half as good as the book. But I love him. He didn't make my list because I didn't love The Lincoln Highway. And that doesn't necessarily mean somebody's not going to be on my list because I do talk about one author whose latest book I didn't like either, and I still included him on the list. But I just thought, I'm not going to put him on today. But I do love his books. And the next time he has one coming out, I will be the first one in line for it. Yeah, The Lincoln Highway, I think, of the three was my least favorite. But I think that's still high praise because I just love the other two so much. Absolutely. Me too. And I didn't know A Gentleman in Moscow was going to be a movie. Where where have I been? (laughs) Yes. And Ewan McGregor is playing the Count. Oh, oh, my word. Yeah. So I know I am just so excited. I have no idea how all this striking is affecting that, but I am so excited. I know they've already had clips and trailers and stuff. So hopefully it is far enough along that it is still moving along. And I'm not sure when the release date is, but I cannot wait. That's something fun to look forward to. Definitely. Well, who is your first autobi author? So this one will surprise absolutely no one. My first autobi author is Jane Harper. Mm -hmm. And she is the exception on the series as well, because she does have a series of three. She is finished with the series and she also writes standalones. So that's why I went ahead and included her because I think her series is done and she also focuses on standalones and I just love her. So I could not leave her off the list. Yeah, I knew that you were going to put her on there. (laughs) And so I didn't because I, I love her too. And I've read everything but The Lost Man. And I think you said that was your favorite by her, right? I was just going to say, that's my favorite. It's the best of all of them. That's great because I have that to look forward to. But um, I knew you were going to chat about her. So I'm like, I'll leave her for Cindy. And I would have said before Alice Feeney and Kelly Hooker's event that Jane Harper's event was my greatest literary event of the year. But now Alice Feeney and Kelly Hooker are neck and neck with Jane Harper. (laughs) So they are my two best literary events of the year. So I just think Jane is delightful. I have interviewed her at the bookstore. I've interviewed her online for the bookstore. I've you know talked with her for the podcast and then I hosted her. So I am like a super fan, but she's just delightful. I love the way she writes. I think her pacing is just perfect. I always talk about a strong sense of place and I think she is a master of that. You know, wherever you are in the story, if it's in the desert, if it's in the outback, if it's in the mountains, you literally can just feel the setting around you. And I just think she does such an amazing job. And she really plots so well. You know, you get to the end and there are twists. You do not see them coming, but you're like, how did I not see that coming? Like, it's just so well done. It's not out of left field. It's not super obvious. It's just right there. And she's crafted it so well. So I just, you know, I'm sure everyone in the world already knows this, but Jane Harper is my very favorite author. I love your love for her. Yes. (laughs) So who's next for you? Claire McIntosh. Oh, that's a good one. Yes. She is so masterful at striking the perfect balance between plot and characters. And she was previously a police officer and a detective prior to becoming an author. And I just think the way that she weaves that into her stories is so creative. And I actually had the chance to moderate an author event with source books and got to chat with Claire. And she was fantastic. And it was just a dream come true for me because she has just always been one of those authors that no matter what she writes, I will read it. So my favorite, oh gosh, I don't even think I could pick a favorite, but um, a couple of the books that I've loved that she's written were I Let You Go. One of the best twists that I've ever read in a thriller is in that book. I thought it was so just like head spinning. And then I loved Hostage because It was so fast paced and then had this really unpredictable ending. And then I read I See You and then most recently The Last Party. And this, like we were talking about, starts a new series. It's a Fionn Morgan series. And 
in our chat together, she said that she would keep writing these as long as people would read them. So please, everybody read the, these because I want her to keep going. But her next book is in this series, and it's called A Game of Lies. And it's a murder mystery that takes place on the set of a reality TV show in Wales. So I'm really excited for that. I'm not sure when it's coming, but it's coming. April. April. Okay. Yes. At least that's what I have seen is that it's coming in April, but it's coming out in the UK sooner. And I think I'm going to try to get it because I loved The Last Party as well. I just thought it was so well done, the setting, the mystery, all of it. And so I'm super excited for this one. So I was thinking about trying to figure out how to order it from the UK and get it before the galleys would be ready for April. Yeah. Well, Blackwell's, I think, does free shipping. So that might be something to look into. Okay, good. And I think it's not till sometime this fall, like October or November in the UK. Okay. And I love Tossage, but those are the only twos of hers that I've read. So apparently I need to get I See You Go. Is that the name of it? I See You Go? I Let You Go. And then there's I See You. That's a separate book. But I Let You Go is one of my favorites of all time. Well, then I'm going to add that one to my list. Good. So my next person is Kate Morton. She writes historical fiction. I have been a fan of hers since her very first book, which was written in 2007, The House at Riverton. I've read each book as it has come out. I have seen her speak in Houston a number of times. I saw her speak at Book Expo once. I desperately tried to interview her for the podcast, and I just could not ever get them to find a time for me. I tried and tried. I was really hoping because I loved her most recent book, Homecoming, but I just didn't have any luck. But again, she's another person who writes an incredibly strong sense of place. This latest one is set in Australia where she lives. And so I loved that because I really like anything set in Australia for the most part. So I just think she does a really great job of bringing to life a time period. They are definitely character-driven stories because I have seen people saying, oh, they're so slow, but they're not plot-driven. I mean, they are very focused on a community or a house or a town or whatever it is and what is unfolding between those people. And so that is kind of the way she writes. But I just think she's a masterful writer. She usually puts out a book like every four or five years. So since Homecoming just came out, I'm sure it's going to be a long time before her next one's coming out. But I just adore all of her books. I'm so excited to hear you say that because just this last year, I have read The Forgotten Garden, and that was my first book by hers. And I really enjoyed it. And so I have another one on my shelf. I think it's The Secret Keeper. Yes. Okay. And I'm excited for that one, too. And then there's one like The Clockmaker's Daughter, something about a clock. And it was her last book. And I really liked that one. It was the first book that was a departure from the way she structured her first five books, where really historical fiction set around a group of people, often at a house. And The Clockmaker's Daughter, I think is the name of it, is really kind of focuses on the house almost. And it's just done a little differently. But I loved it. I thought it was super well done. And I'm always excited when an author is trying something different. I'm not always excited. I'm usually excited when an author is trying something different. Yeah, I think that shows a lot of versatility. Exactly. Okay, well, speaking of versatility, I am going to chat about Alice Feeney next. I wondered if she was on your list. I was wondering if she is she on yours? This is my first book by her. And so I approach my literary salon sometimes a little differently than I approach the podcast because for the podcast, I want to have read the book. I want to have liked the book. And, you know, I'm putting my name behind it. But with the salon, for the most part, that's the same. But sometimes there are people coming through like Mary Kay Andrews we hosted. I'm not really a Mary Kay Andrews reader. I don't dislike her books, but that's just not really my genre. But she was so entertaining. And so I thought people will love to see her. She's very popular. And so that's how it is with Alice Feeney. I know she's so popular. People love her. This book sounds appealing to me. It's got an awesome cover. And I just thought she's coming from the UK. I can't pass it up. And I knew like you loved her and several other people who I, I usually like their recommendations loved her. So I went ahead and said yes, even though I haven't read any of her books yet. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Well, she has a an extensive backlist. I think she's got six books and she's kind of really in the last five years been on a one book a year track, which sometimes makes me nervous um, that authors are just kind of cranking them out or phoning them in. But I have felt like each of her books was very different and very thought provoking and clever. Like I never see any of the endings coming, especially her first book, Sometimes I Lie. I was just like, what in the world did I just read? And like, I kind of wanted to throw it against the wall but I kind of liked it. And I just it, it still sticks with me. And so I can't say that a lot about a lot of books that I have read, you know, years ago. So 
Also, His and Hers is my favorite thriller to recommend on audio because the killer has a point of view and that person's voice is anonymized. And so it's this very creepy voice. And so for audiobook listeners, it's really fun. And her latest book is Good Bad Girl, and it comes out August 29th. And I just finished this. I really liked it. It is more domestic suspense compared to her previous books, which read more like mysteries and thrillers. Her latest book reminds me kind of of a Sally Hepworth, like juicy family drama, mother-daughter situation, but I did really like it. I'm not always a domestic thriller person, but the domestic thrillers I don't like are the couples ones. And when there's an affair or the babysitter, I don't mind the mother-daughter or family drama at all. And this one has such a stellar cover. Thriller covers often to me are so similar and I feel like this one really stands out and I'm so excited to read it and I hear she's delightful. And the other funny thing, and I'm trying to remember who it was, but when I interviewed another UK thriller writer not that long ago, (laughs) she made like an off the cuff remark about Alice Feeney. I, I think I said I was hosting her, so it had to have been not too long ago. And she said, oh, she's way more popular there than she is here. Oh, I know. I was like, oh. So I just said, oh, I don't know anything about that. (laughs) It's kind of like, I'm not getting involved in this. Kind of like a backhanded compliment, but... I don't think it was a backhanded compliment. I think it was a (laughs) backhanded uh, insult. I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) So I thought that was kind of funny. Huh. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Who's next for you? Another big surprise, Fiona Davis. Oh, Somebody that I'm sure no one is surprised that I am also listing. I love New York City and I love that she focuses on a separate building in each book. Like to me, it is just so cool to learn about each of these places that she writes about. My two favorite are The Lions of Fifth Avenue, which is set in the New York Public Library. The idea of living in that library, that they had an apartment and that the librarian got to live there ages ago was just the coolest thing to me. Like I just loved that. And then the Magnolia Palace about the Frick, because I love the Frick and I liked the scavenger hunt and the artwork. Like those two stories just really, really worked for me. But I love all of hers. And I recently loved The Spectacular with Radio City. And she's focusing on the Met next, which is one of my favorite museums. And she just went to Egypt on a trip related to this book. So I'm just super excited all the way around. And she's the one, she's such a delightful person. Like I've known her for a long time. Her parents used to live here. So She'd come to Murder by the Book all the time, and I've seen her in New York at various events. She's just delightful. But when I interviewed her recently, she's the one that gave me the idea for the spoiler-filled conversations that I'm doing for Lit Lovers, and I'm interviewing her soon for that. Oh, that's so fun. I love that she gave you that idea. Yes, and I thought it was such a fun idea. I don't know why I hadn't thought of it. And I am loving those conversations. Like It is just so much fun to kind of dive into the -the behind-the-scenes stuff and talk about things I can't talk about on the regular show. I just feel like they're fun, deep dives. Yes. And I love the last spoiler episode that you did because you featured four different books and I had read all of them. So I didn't have to like stop and go to different timestamps to make sure that I didn't spoil anything because it was just all one big spoiler episode and I loved it. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. And it was so nice of her to suggest that. And I can't wait to chat with her more about the spectacular. Yes. Next up for me is Elizabeth Passarella. She is the author of Good Apple and it was an ugly couch anyway. They are both memoirs slash essay collections. And she is so witty. And her writing just feels really refreshing. But she also takes on some more vulnerable topics like grief and faith and motherhood. But what I love most about her writing is that it just feels like you're talking with an old friend. You're like sitting on a patio somewhere with a glass of wine or a cup of coffee and just chatting. She just has a way of drawing readers in that makes you feel comfortable with her. And when her latest book, It Was an Ugly Couch Anyway, came out in May, I had the opportunity to do an IG Live with her on Instagram. And I got to ask her about the book. And it was so, so fun to chat with her because it did feel like I was chatting with a friend, even though we've never met in person, just kind of chatted online a little bit. Uh, But I had asked her, I'm like, well, what's next for you? And she's like, I know I'm supposed to say I'm working on another book. But um, she's like, when you're writing about your life, It's just not that easy. You know, you need time to live your life and just to let things come up that you are going to write about. And so she's working on finishing up her house. And so if you follow her journey on Instagram, I know we talked about this before, but it's so fun to watch the progress. 
so she has saved all of the original doorknobs and like really cool windows and aspects of the house that are so cool in New York City. So she's one of my favorites. She's one of my favorites too. And she should have been on my list. It was really hard to get to 10. Yeah. Even though I thought at first it was going to be hard to have five. And then I started thinking through it. So I love her too. So she's going to be my little 11 that will fit in with the others because she's just so delightful, so much fun to chat with. And I listened to her second book, which she narrated, and it truly felt like I was listening to a friend. So yeah. by the time I went to talk to her about it with the, for the interview and the spoilers, I was like, oh, I already feel like I have listened to this voice for so long. But she's great. And her stories are just, I just, they just completely resonate with me. Yep, me too. So my next is Win Fan Kui Mai. Her debut novel was The Mountain Sing, which remains one of my all-time favorite historical fiction reads. I just loved that book. And it's another one of those that I think about regularly. I loved that she wove in decades of Vietnamese history, the Vietnamese perspective of what it was like on what we call the Vietnam War. I think they just call it the Great War. I can't remember what they call it, but they don't call it the Vietnam War. And what it was like after that war, when the two sides were split and how much it divided the country and all this cultural details and proverbs they have and the food. I mean, she really just brings it all to life. And then she had her second book, Dust Child, come out this year. I got to host her in Houston, which was so delightful. And our literary salon first was packed. Second, everybody was tearing up. She was so engaging and she told the greatest stories and she really, really reached people. It was just not like anything else I've ever seen. If you have any opportunity to ever see her, I would say it is well worth it. She sang, she read in English, she read in Vietnamese. She just is amazing. And so I am eagerly awaiting whatever will be next for her. But I'm sure she's not writing much now because she's been on a whirlwind many months long tour. Yes, I have not read The Mountain Sing. Otherwise, she would have been on my list alone just because I loved Dust Child. But I added that to my TBR and I already owned it. So that was <laughs> that was perfect. So I do plan to read The Mountain Sing. And what's really extra amazing about those books is that she is Vietnamese. She didn't learn English till she was like 14. And she wrote both of them in English. So I just think she writes better in English as her second language that I can ever write in English as my first language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is incredible. It is. Next for me is Ilona Bannister. She's the author of When I Ran Away and Little Prisons. The way that she writes about motherhood and mental health really resonates with me. She was previously a lawyer, and she is the mother of a neurodiverse child. She also experienced mental health concerns postpartum. So I love how she weaves her personal experiences into her books because you can tell that she has just lived these things. And Little Prisons was a top read of 2022 for me. And I, I've mentioned this before, but it's only available in the UK. So um, you can order it through Blackwell's and it's only $11, including shipping. So for the paperback, and that is money well spent. So I just reached out to her yesterday to see what she was up to now. And she said she's working on her third manuscript this summer. And she lives in London with her husband and two little boys. And she mentioned that it was just so tricky with her kids home for the summer to make much progress on her manuscript. But I can't wait to see what she comes up with next. I have not read her before, but I know how much you love her. Yes, I really do. So my next author is Annabelle Monahan. While romance is not often my genre, I love Annabelle's books so much. They are filled with heart, humor, and really genuine characters. People that I feel like I can identify with, I'm interested in, I want to know what's happening with them and how it's going to go for them. Nora Goes Off Script still holds the top spot of her books for me, but I really, really enjoyed Same Time Next Summer as well. The music aspect of the storyline really appealed to me because I love music and I thought it was really fun that Wyatt was a musician and how that was interwoven into the story. And there were so many songs mentioned and the relationship had so much to do with music. So I just loved that. She has a new book she's working on. I don't know if a date has been set for it yet, but she talked a little bit about it when I interviewed her at Blue Willow in June and I'm anxiously awaiting it. Her male love interests really seem to resonate with readers. There were so many questions about them at Blue Willow. And I've seen a lot of other people posting about how much they love both Leo and Wyatt. And people are like, Team Leo, Team Wyatt. So it's really fun when characters resonate so much with readers. Yes, I don't typically read a lot of romance, but 
I adored Nora Goes Off Script and I read it like nine months pregnant, I think last year in the middle of the night, like every night I'd wake up at 3 a.m. and I would just like grab my Kindle and pick that book up. But I loved it so much. I have recommended it to everyone I know. I mean, anytime anybody says to me, I need a lighter read, I'm like, Nora goes off script and every Mm -hmm. single person comes back and says, I loved that book so much. Good. Yeah. It's a good one to recommend pretty universally. Exactly. Next up for me is Ethan Joella. And I genuinely adore him as a person. I think that he is a delight. He is just a bookstagram darling. Like he is always involved with readers and their reviews and commenting. And so therefore he can do no wrong in my opinion. But he is the author of A Little Hope and A Quiet Life. And I love that his characters are always so nuanced. They have these flaws, but you can't help but root for them. And then they always show really great growth in their character arcs. And the other thing I think he does really well is he showcases the power of community in a way that just touches my heart. He just has this large cast of characters whose lives become intertwined together, and you kind of see how they all connect over the course of the story, and I always love that. So I did an author chat with him with Ivana for our Chapters and Chats book club, and he pointed out that his two published books have seasonal covers. So A Little Hope has a fall cover and A Quiet Life has a winter cover. So his goal is to get all four seasons on a cover. So he's currently working on his next book and the cover is not released yet, but I just messaged him and was chatting a little bit. His next book is set in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, where he lives. And he said it covers a full year, but it's definitely got summer vibes and the cover is very summery, he says. So I'm really excited for that one. And it comes out sometime next year. I read the second book and I participated in your chat and he did seem like he was a really good guy. Yeah, I think so. So after we were talking about Claire McIntosh, I thought I'm going to go back and look up when A Game of Lies is coming out in the UK. And so I looked on Goodreads. It actually came out last week. So I'm going to definitely get it ordered. And it comes out April 2024 from Sourcebooks, but it came out July 20th in the UK. So I'm so glad we had this conversation. As soon as we hang up, I'm going to get it ordered and I'm going to get it read because I am just so excited for it. I don't want to wait. No. Oh, that's awesome. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Scout it out for us. I will. My next author is Patrick Radden Keefe. This is the only nonfiction author I'm including, though I should have included Elizabeth Passarella. So they are the only two nonfiction authors I'm including. But he is one of those writers that makes everything sound thrilling. You feel like you're reading a thriller no matter what you're reading about. I think his writing is absolutely stellar. I still need to read Say Nothing and The Snakehead, but I have read his more recent books, Empire of Pain, about the opioid epidemic and the Sacklers, and then Rogues, which is a combination of a bunch of his New Yorker articles that are all still long, but much shorter than a regular book. And there's 12 of them compiled into Rogues. And I sat down to read Rogues and I thought, I'll read one essay and then I'll come back later. And I read all of them in one day. I just thought it was so amazing. And then I listened to Empire of Pain while I was walking and I kept taking way longer walks than I normally do because I didn't want to stop the book. And I was always like saying, you know, stuff back to the audio. I'm sure my neighbors thought I was nuts, but I was like, okay, this book is so good. So he is a definite autobi author for me. And the only person nonfiction wise that I think at all holds a candle to being able to just make a story that fast and compelling was Rory Campbell, who wrote There Will Be Fire This Spring. So he would also be an autobi author for me, but I've only read his one book. But Patrick Radden Keefe definitely is. And I'm so curious what he is doing next. Yes, I really thought that Empire of Pain was so well researched and compelling. It wasn't dry at all. And totally agree with everything you said. I mean, you just read it and you're like, how could these people be so incredibly horrible? Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And nobody knows. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Or they're turning the other cheek now, I guess. Yeah, it's definitely coming out, but it is just really interesting. Yeah, agreed. Who's next for you? John Mars. He writes really thought-provoking speculative fiction. And he's always got this large cast of characters that have multiple points of view. And so it's really captivating to see as the book goes on how they're all connected and all the secrets that come out and all of his chapters end with a little cliffhanger, which makes them so readable. And I I will say he writes kind of two brands of books. He's got the more speculative fiction side, which is the one 
the Passengers and the Marriage Act, also the Minders, which I haven't read yet, but I hope to. And these are all set in the same near future dystopian world. And the books reference each other, which is kind of fun. But then he's also got another more dark thriller genre that he writes. And I read one of them, What Lies Between Us. We just actually did this for our in-person book club. And this was dark. I didn't love it. And I actually ended up DNFing it. It's so interesting to me that an author can write books that are big wins for me. And then also write another book that I'm like, ooh, this one's not for me at all. So he does have an upcoming book called The Vacation that comes out in December. And this is actually a re-release of a previous book he wrote called Welcome to Wherever You Are about like four or five years ago in the UK. So I'm curious about this. It does have a lot of characters, which some readers did not like, but that's kind of how his other books are too. So I'm expecting that and we'll see how it goes. I haven't really read him before. I think I might've picked up one or two and tried them, but just not gotten very far. Not really DNF'd, but just maybe wasn't in the mood, but I really do need to try him. And the audio books are really like full productions, really fun. They have a lot of unique elements to them too. Okay, good. I might try that. Yeah. What's up for you? Patty Callahan Henry. So I love all of her later books or historical fiction. She has an entire backlist of women's fiction titles. I haven't read any of them. I don't read a lot of that. So I don't think I'll probably pick those up. But I love all of her historical fiction that I have read. Her most recent book, The Secret Book of Flora Lee, I liked but I loved Surviving Savannah and Once Upon a Wardrobe remains one of my all-time favorite books. So it just really struck a chord with me and I just felt somehow the story resonated with me. I've always loved C.S. Lewis and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So I think that helped. I liked the way the story unfolded. I just loved everything about it. She's such a delight to interview. She's one of those really engaging people who always has a lot to say and I feel like I learn a lot from her. Surviving Savannah was such an interesting story about the ship that went down long before the Titanic. And the other one of hers that I haven't read that's historical fiction is Becoming Mrs. Lewis, which people just rave about. And I have it and I need to get it read, but I haven't had a chance yet. But I just love Patty and I feel like she's just one of those people that always has a lot to say and is a really beautiful writer. Yeah, I adored Once Upon a Wardrobe. I read it over Christmas after it came out, and it just felt like the perfect, cozy holiday read. It's just a beautiful story. You know, the sibling relationship and learning about C.S. Lewis and Oxford just kind of brings together so many wonderful things. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Okay, next for me is William Kent Kruger. I love, love his books. Uh, He has written Ordinary Grace, This Tender Land, the Cork O'Connor series. And his most recent is The River We Remember. I think that he is the king of the coming of age story. He writes about the natural world in such a visceral way. And you can just tell that he's so deeply connected to the natural world. Like he loves the outdoors. And he actually, I saw this summer, he's hosting reading retreats in the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. And that's where a lot of his books are set. And he also has a deep love for local libraries, and he's hosting a book event for his upcoming book with a cookout at a small town library in Nebraska. And I I just think that's wonderful. But his characters always go through some formative life event that takes them from boys to men, and his mysteries are very thoughtful and layered. I just love his story so much. So I haven't read much of the Cork O'Connor series. A couple years ago, he released Lightning Strike, which is actually a prequel to the series. So I read that and then I did read the first book, Iron Lake, which came out years ago. I mean, he's got, gosh, I mean, I think maybe like 18 books or something in this series. So I I think I might dip back into that at some point. But again, I always get swept away with the new releases. But um, yeah, William Kent Kruger, I will read anything he writes. I I loved his upcoming The River We Remember. It comes out in August, and I know that you did too. Yes, it comes out September 5th. I um, loved it too. I just thought it was absolutely beautiful, and I love him. He used to come to Murder by the Book, and I would hear him speak then, and I've interviewed him. I just actually interviewed him yesterday for The River We Remember, and I had interviewed him for his audiobook before. But I love the Cork O'Connor series. I have read the later ones, maybe the last six. But my husband started at book one not too long ago, 
and he's maybe a book seven. And I think he's reading other stuff now, but he's kind of working his way through them. And he just loves them. Yes, he is really the king of the coming of age story, but also another good person who writes about an area that not many people know very well, you know, kind of this small town, Southern Minnesota area. And I just, I love it. I loved The River We Remember. Yes. So good. Yes. So good. So my next is Dolan Perkins Valdez. Take My Hand is one of those books that I still think about regularly. You can tell there are some stories that have just stayed with me and they literally just pop into my head at different times. I should like create a shelf with these books, but Take My Hand is one of them. And I love that it has resonated with so many people. I still hear people talking about it all the time. I see it, people reading it when I'm traveling. I know book clubs are reading. In fact, my book club is reading it for the fall. And I just love that it is one of those stories that has stayed around. And I think it's one, because it's beautiful. Two, because there's so much happening in the U.S. right now regarding reproductive rights. And I feel like this story ties into that. I have not read her second book, Balm, but I read her first book, Wench, years ago when it came out. And I really liked it as well. It had to do with the place that white slave owners took their slave mistresses away for the weekend to this resort. It was disturbing and kind of hard to fathom, but it was an interesting story and learning about that time period and everything. But I just think that she writes so beautifully. And she's another one of those people that I just absolutely loved interviewing her. And that interview still does so well. It's one of my top listened to interviews. And I think it's because she's just such a delightful person to listen to. And she has so much to say that's interesting and relevant. Yeah, I also loved Take My Hands, and I have not read any of her backlist books, but I'm really looking forward to reading whatever she writes next. Me too. Next for me is Blake Crouch. And I picked up Dark Matter about five years ago on the recommendation of Anne Bogle. And she is not usually a science fiction reader. And so I thought, okay, if she really likes this, I might too. She said it read like a thriller. And so I thought, okay. This was really my first foray into that genre, and I'm so glad I gave it a chance because I could not put this book down. And he wrote Recursion and Upgrade, and both of these were, all of his books really, were five-star reads for me. They just fly through, they make you think, um, and I don't get caught in the weeds of the scientific factors. Everything just flows really well for me. So I saw that he is writing a new book, according to his website, um, but he's also creating a nine episode adaptation of Dark Matter for Apple TV and season one wrapped up filming, I think, in April. So I don't know when that's coming, but soon and I'm excited. Okay, that's great to know. I loved Recursion. It's the only one of his that I've read all the way through, but I'm dying to read Dark Matter. So that means I need to get it picked up and read before the show comes because I always want to read a book before I watch the show. And then he also has a trilogy, something about pines, white yes. pines, lost pines, something like that, but I've not read it. I started it and I was intrigued, but then something else came along. So I haven't picked it back up, but he has, I want to say three pines. It's three pines, maybe. Okay. I was like, something to do with pines. <laughs> yeah. Or is that Louise Penny? Yeah. Is it in three, Louise Penny, three pines? Yeah. I think it's just the pines. Oh, okay. I was like, I don't know, something about pines. Yeah. <laughs> so, But I loved Recursion. I thought it was really, really good. And that's good to know he has a new book coming up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what's next for you? So Tracy Lang, We Are the Brennans was a top read of 2021 for me. And so I was eagerly awaiting the Connollys of County Down. And it will be the same for 2023. Celadon did a really cool thing with this one where they put us into groups of four. I know you did the same thing, Kelly. And we read the book in pieces and then talked about it on Instagram and chats. And it was so much fun to see what people thought about the book and hear what they noticed that maybe I didn't. And I just thought it was so well done. And in fact, I loved it even more than I loved We Are the Brennans. I just think that she does a great job of writing family sagas with stories about characters that you really root for and they feel authentic and real, but they're not so grim. Like so many family sagas deal with some form of abuse or incest or rape or something. And I just can't stand all of that. Like I just feel like I can't always read all this dark stuff. And so she delves into to interesting issues and they have depth, but they're not so grim that when you're done, you're like, oh my gosh, these people. So I love that. And I wish there were more people writing that type of book, but I think she is just a wonderful writer and I love the stories that she comes up with. Yes. I love both of those too. And she writes like just big, lovable messes, (laughs) 
Um, Like you said, they're not too dark, but it's just this drama that you just can't help but love. Well, and I think the characters resonate with me. Sometimes I read these others and I'm like, who does this stuff? And like, why would you want to hear about them or hang out with them? And so at least with her characters, I think, oh, I know people like that. Or that makes sense that she made those choices. Like, I just feel like I can understand it better than I can understand some of these other things. And it's interesting because a friend of mine, Laurie, who is book addict PNW, I think is her. Yeah. She just posted about the whispers and she was talking about, because, you know, you and I have talked about the whispers and the DNFing of it. Uh, I DNFed it. I think you finished it, but didn't like it. And so she was calling it rubbernecking or something like that. And she said, you know, you read a book like the whispers, which she didn't like, but she said, I couldn't turn away. And I think that's like a good way to describe it. Like, I think sometimes for some of these books for people are rubbernecking and I'm not a big rubbernecker anyway. And so maybe that is what happens. I'm like, I don't really care. You know, like I need to move on, but like, I don't need to see all the fails that are these people. And I think some people enjoy those stories and that's great. I mean, again, there are many books out there and everybody likes something different. Yeah, I actually just saw Lori's post as well and commented on that too. I think that she described it so well. But with Tracy Lang's characters, you really just can get into their shoes and root for them. Yes. And understand them. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. So now we're to your last one. Yes. My last one is Tiffany McDaniel. She is the author of Betty and On the Savage Side, which just came out in February, and it'll be a top read of the year for me. So Tiffany is a poet, and that is so evident in her writing because it is lyrical. It is very dark. But her books are brimming with symbolism and her sentences can just take your breath away. Her books explore generational trauma and she doesn't do anything for shock value. Like we were just talking about with the rubbernecking, there is a beautiful message and a purpose behind everything that she writes. And I so appreciate that. It's Her books are not for everyone. Let me be clear. Betty and On the Savage Side are both very, very dark. But I just like how she shines a light in this darkness and tries to make something beautiful out of it. And I was looking back, I was thinking that Betty was her debut, but she actually has another book, The Summer That Melted Everything, that came out in 2016. And so I would love to go back and read that book. Tiffany also does not have social media. It says she lives a social media free life, and I think she lives in the woods with her cats and <laughs> more power to her, but she it's hard to, to get a pulse on what she's doing. But I I loved her writing. You know, it's so interesting because you don't see many authors that have no social media presence. But Pip Williams is the same. When I finished my interview with her, I said, well, I'll tag you everywhere on social media. She goes, oh, I'm not on social media. I was like, oh, wow. But she has a really great website, but she doesn't have social media. But, you know, more power to them. I mean, if that is, you know, however people want to do it is great, but you don't see it very often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. She probably has more time to write. Exactly. (laughs) She's focused on that. So that's good. Well, I'm excited to hear your last author. So my last author is Stephen Rowley, which means we had no overlap, right? No, I thought we might. Isn't that funny, though, Elizabeth Passarella? I should have included her. So I'm just squeezing her in to make it my my 10.5. So we had one overlap. So but mine is Stephen Rowley. And I think you mentioned this with John Mars, that it's interesting to have an autobi author where you didn't really like one of their books. So I tried to read The Celebrants. I didn't love it. There was a lot of mixed feedback about it. So I ended up DNFing it. But I absolutely loved the editor and the Gunkel. And I would plan to read whatever he has next. So I figure he can still be an autobi author for me. Sometimes they're just certain stories that don't resonate. But I just love the way he creates these characters that you just want to spend time with. I've always loved Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And so she's in the editor because she was an editor at Doubleday. And so I thought that was really clever. I learned a lot about her that way. I liked how he brought her to life. And then the Gunkle. I mean, there's just such a sweet story, you know, the the family and the uncle stepping in to help his children and just all the hilarious things that he does because he's not used to being around kids. So I think Stephen Rowley is delightful. I had actually scheduled an interview, thankfully, through the satellite people, not through his publicist this year. And then I didn't really like the celebrant, so I had to cancel it. So I was like, ah, but hopefully he does not know that. And there are plenty of other people interviewing him, so it was all good. But I am so excited for whatever he writes next. I just think he is a really genuinely nice person. And I like the way he presents stories on the page, usually. Yes, I loved the Gunkle. I did like the celebrants, I think, more so than most people. I thought it was a nice tribute to friendship. But I 
am going to pick up the editor this summer because I ordered it after, I think in a previous episode, you had mentioned it was one of your all-time favorite books. So I'm like, okay, I better read this. So um, I got my hands on it and I just put it into my updated Battle of the Backburner. So I plan to read it working through my battle of backlist books that I'm I'm kind of slowly tackling throughout the year. So that will be um, coming up soon for me. I would definitely say it is a read that I loved. It's probably not like in my top five or anything, but it is definitely one that I so enjoyed. And it's my favorite of his. I liked it even more than The Gunkel. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. I didn't even know that he had had books before The Gunkel. So when you mentioned that, I thought, oh, good, I better check that out. And he has one before that, too, which was very popular, Lily and the Octopus, but I haven't read it. I just got um, a paperback of that sent to me by the publisher as well. So I plan to read that at some point too. Oh, good. I'm going to quickly highlight those series authors that I was talking about for anybody that does love series. The first is Alice Henderson. She's written three books. They are focused on environmental issues, but each one focuses on a particular animal. The first one was a wolverine. The second was a polar bear. And the third was the caribou. It's like the mountain caribou. I was trying to remember what that And I was thinking she would have a fourth book coming out this fall, but I couldn't find that anywhere. I know she is writing one and it's about a jaguar, I'm pretty sure, set in New Mexico. So I'm not sure if that means it's just not coming out this fall, but maybe it was bumped back a little bit. But I love that series. And then Robert Poby, who writes a character called Lucas Page. They're set in New York City. He's a former FBI agent who is a professor now of astrophysics at Columbia. They're very clever. Some of the best crafted mysteries I've ever read. Then Nick Petrie writes about an Afghanistan veteran who is back in the U.S. working on all of these creative crimes that he also solves. Jacqueline Winspear with Maisie Dobbs. Ashley Weaver. I don't love her first series, but I love her current one about Electra. Electra somebody. And they're all set during World War II. There's three of them so far. They usually come out in May and they're super well done. And then Deanna Rayburn, who I always love her Veronica Speedwell series, which is just one of my all-time favorites. And then last, Richard Osman, who writes the the ones that are set at the retirement home in the UK. And I love CJ Box. So the CJ Box and the Jacqueline Winspear are much longer. I think CJ Box is on like book 23, but I have read them since the beginning. They're set outdoors in Wyoming. He has a TV show. The first series was really good. The first season, season two is not nearly as good. It's not as well cast. And I think maybe they had less of a budget because <laughs> The acting isn't as good, but I love the books. They continue to stay very good. And then Jacqueline Winspear, I think, is also in like book 20. But the rest of them don't have that many books yet in their series. Okay. So interesting. Yeah. Well, good. Well, this was so much fun and so much more involved than I thought it was going to be when we first started talking about it. I was like, oh, I'll put together five autobi authors and it'll be easy. And I started looking at it and thinking about it. And I was like, well, this actually is a lot harder and more thought provoking than I thought it was going to be. I know. And it was fun to go internet stalk some of these authors and see like, okay, what's up next for them? I got to know. I know. I couldn't find much on that. I think because a lot of mine don't write super often. But yes, it was interesting to try to see what was out there. Yes. I had so much fun chatting about this, Cindy. Me too. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. You might be surprised to know that not all serial killers are straight cisgender white men, and the victims of true crime are not a monolith either. She's Wendy and I'm Beth, and together we host Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color, a true crime podcast. Together we take deep dives into the true crime stories about marginalized and minoritized perps and victims that often go untold. We also provide the context and nuance that these stories deserve. At Fruit Loops, we're serving up true crime with a side of history, society, culture, and some fun. Listen to Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 